Texas Video History from the J. Bay Jacobs Library for the History of Obstetrics and Gynecology in America. And my guest this afternoon on a warm spring afternoon in April of 1992 in Las Vegas, Dr. James L. Green. Jim was the president of ACOG in 1983-84, is director of the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at the St. Barnabas Medical Center in New Jersey, as well as being clinical professor in obstetrics and gynecology, both at Jefferson University in Philadelphia and the College of Medicine and Dentistry in New Jersey, which is based in a number of places, I guess, which campus is your responsibility? Well, uh, the main campus is in Newark. Yeah, that's that particular arm. Dr. Green's been known for many things over the years in addition to his, his contributions to the college. But if you like to start at the beginning, so tell me where you were born. I was born in Chicago, Illinois, 5, five September 1926. You didn't have to do the grade. Well, I, I, I thought I'd be open about it. Yeah. Now, now, I know that you have come from a distinguished military family. Would you like to say a word about that? Well, my father was a graduate of West Point. So as a child, we kept moving around. I don't think I lived in one institution more than two or three years, which really posed somewhat of a problem when I applied to medical school, having gone to about 10 high schools. I went to college, lived there, so. And that's, the family goes back on both sides, but my main influence was through my father. Where, where was he stationed when you were born in Chicago? He was, he was stationed at the, uh, at Sheridan. And he was a physician? No, he was a, a line he, officer. He was a line officer. Yeah. In what branch? He, he was in, in ordnance. And that was, and that was so far back at that time, there were only about 200 officers in the ordnance corps. And so he'd gone to MIT and Lehigh, so he was interested in that merger and things like that. So he sort of put him in that arm. Starting out in Chicago and having uh, moved a lot of places, uh, where did you end up in college and medical school? Basically, I had my first year of college at, at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore, and then we were transferred and ended up in Northwestern for my last three years and went from there into medical school at the state of Chicago. And was your father then back at Fort Sheridan? Yes, and he retired from Chicago, and I stayed on. Was he uh, there during World War II or no? No. Yes. Active elsewhere? Elsewhere and then overseas. And you graduated from Northwestern in what year? It's, it's all right for me to ask you that. That's okay. Yeah. I, I think it's the uh, undergraduate in 47 in medical school, 48 and then medical school in 52. I can remember it fairly clearly. I would think you were a behind me. I would yes. think you would have warned you. Yeah, that's true. What, uh, what happened then? Uh, well, after that, you know, it, I think we're all in the same category. Of still the last of the five-year medical school, so we had to satisfactorily complete an internship. And I interned before, we got, an MD before we got the MD degree, which is very unusual. They were all applying for things, and so I applied for Walter Reed, which was on a very prestigious internship. And if I can diverse something, I still remember the dean telling me if I went the military route, that that would be the end of my professional and academic career. <laughs> Northwestern is a very and that sort of concept. But you, you were then uh, in a military program. Yes. So I went to Walter Reed, and I stayed on there both as a, as a resident and as a fellow. And uh, finished that? Finished that in about 57, and then I went to Europe as a consultant for about two years. And then came back to one year of fellowship at OBGY in breast pathology at the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology. I seem to remember that uh, back in the time that you, that you were involved Walter Reed, you were involved with treating the Eisenhowers. Yes, so Mrs. Eisenhower had her surgery during my, my time there, which is a story unto itself. I don't know. And uh, tell us a little bit about the uh, Armed Forces Institute of Pathology work. It's a uh, it's still an important program, it's still perhaps more supported by the uh, armed forces than it is by any other part of the college. Yeah, yeah, that's true. It's still, the FIP, as we call it, is still the leading institute of pathology in the world. And uh, they have about 126 full-time 
colleges. And they have fellowships in all the various divisions. So the year I was there was really wonderful because it's a strictly a referral system. So every case is a semi problem case. And as far as I know, I go back now and then it has not changed at all. And their I think their budgeting is a little harder than it used to be, but they still function very well. Who, who were your mentors at the time you were at AFIP? Well, that is a uh, Hugh Grady had just left. He became chairman of pathology at Seton Hall. And so Bob Beckett, Lou Beckett was the next one. And then Herb Taylor, you know, still during, during my time. Now, was, it, was AFIP still located down on the mall? No, no. Those years, no it, it was up on the, it was up on the wall. Yeah, and of course, since then, uh, it's had its ups and downs, but I think it's definitely in the up phase so oh, yeah. at this time. In terms of location and uh, prestige and programs and so on. Well, when when that wound up, uh, then you obviously had some sort of military obligation. Well, I, it, it's funny at that time we were the fellowships in pathology did not require any payback time, and I think by my getting out at that time, it did evolve into the concept there would be payback time yeah. after being left. <laughs> Uh, so I, I think I probably knew something wrong, but uh, at that it was at that point more that uh, the decision as to what to do was made. And with our fifth child coming on the side, and that's to Mickey, that it might be more appropriate to settle down somewhere. So that's why I took this position in New Jersey. And tell us about that. Well, there are three of us in the military at that time, and all three of us went to, which was then the Seton Hall College of Medicine and Dentistry. That was in Jersey City. The three of us basically our role was to take over the Martin Lee, which was still functioning very well. Uh, and so that was our particular role in life, taking care of the students and the residents of the Martin Hay. Because that began to diminish very rapidly for political reasons. And the Hay now is closed, so there's nothing more than a chronic care facility. Or, you know, there certainly were famous names on Martin Hay. Yes, they were. Who were they uh, around the time you were there? Well, Sam Cosgrove had just had just left us, but his brother Bob was still very active in practice. And we still had the great Ed Waters who was there, and John Conley. Waters famous for the extra peritoneal cesarean section. And E.G. was probably the best surgeon in the state of New Jersey. He was an like, excellent surgeon. Uh, but those are about the main three. Everybody else had either passed away. Cosgrove lecture, which we hear every year yeah. in the opening ceremony, came, I, I think, from Sam Cosgrove. Yeah, that was Sam yeah, Cosgrove, yes. right. And, uh, and, uh, my one regret is that I assumed that position, but he'd already died, so that was a little bit too too late. Yeah, when when uh, you left the Margaret Page, what then? Well, then the school was beginning to divide up, and they were just decided that they had to leave. Otherwise, we arbitrarily had to leave Jersey City. And so they had two institutions they were interested in. One was Newark, and the other was in Elizabeth. And so my role, I took over the Newark City Hospital as chief of OPGYN there, which is the large charity hospital in New Jersey. And I stayed there for about seven years. And the school eventually moved into Newark, and that's where the main school is right now. And when did you go to St. Barnabas uh, Hospital? I've been there 22 years now. So I have, have to subtract that out to about 1970. Yeah, yeah, around that time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you've been known for lots of good things in your career. And, and certainly, uh, I guess I would say the two major ones are your uh, love and teaching ability in pathology and your innovations in surgery and surgical technique. Uh, let me start with pathology. You certainly down for the uh, many years for the annual pathology exhibits here and other places. Uh, tell us something about that. Well, that. That evolved a long time ago, Ward, and I think I remember most vividly about that. Uh, it was just a fun concept to have a pathology quiz that could be given to, say, the practitioner with no pretest or post test or scoring or anything, just see how you do. And uh, Herb Nichols was very instrumental. 
getting an NIH grant. If you can believe that back then, it counts for not easily. Not not easily uh, to start this. And after that, we began to get us its funding from other sources. But it became a very large exhibit, I think very popular. It was just a fun thing. I think the only contribution it made was it just sort of to test the acumen of the practicing physician, because most people are not exposed to too much pathology. Well, it certainly focused. I, I always thought the interest of residents in pathology to a little oh, challenge. Yeah, right. I think so. For them. Yeah. And we finally, and that went on for, gosh, 20 plus plus years, I think. Mm-hmm. It's updated about every three years. We ran out of prices to get you. Yeah, that's got to be a little business. embarrassing after a while. Yeah. yeah, yeah. What, uh, tell, tell us a little bit, bit about your career in surgery. Uh, kind of general, but you certainly well known for operating patients. Well, it's, it's hard to say. I was, I was brought up in the time when residents were exposed to a great deal of surgery. And I was fortunate to have trained under a man named Dr. Riva, who was basically trained in general surgery in OBGYN. And Walter Reed being a, a main military referral base, we had an enormous number of patients sent to us. They were not all gynecologic oncology patients, but most were. And I think that was sort of the basis of things. And I just sort of kept going after that. Uh, the 10 years I spent in the military after that were always in places that had a high volume and a low overhead sort of thing. So we kept doing surgery. And that is probably itself into our own institution now, which is a little unusual. That GYN is a very heavy service that's compared to OB. Different in most places. Most places, yeah, it really is. Is, is there a particular operative uh, technique that uh, you'd say you'd like to be remembered for, perhaps? Well, I think the thing I'd like the most, and they're doing in many institutions now, is the, the two-team approach to primary carcinoma uh, of the cervix, and primary surgery for that particular indication. And really, it's a composite operation. It's not that original in that it involves a certain part of the shell on right procedure, which is a radically imagined hysterectomy, with a more conventional abdominal approach, particularly with the extraperitoneal lymphadenectomy. And utilizing two teams allows us to really do what I consider to be a very fine job within a time frame of about two hours. But I've always been fortunate, though, because there are five or six of us operating at the same time. So I'm sort of spoiled from that viewpoint of the man. Ambiguous genitalia, particularly those of vaginal genesis, whether it be partial or total, and we have some slightly different operations we do on those young ladies, which work out very well. But basically, I'm sort of a meat and potatoes, sort of a general run of the mill gynecologic surgery. With an international reputation. Well, I don't know about that, you know, but we do have a large, in fact, we're doing about as much geo-oncology now as we do at Memorial, which is pretty interesting. We have a lot of pride. The uh, college has also been a part of your life. Uh, how, did, how did that begin, and uh, what led you ultimately to the presidency? Well, that's been a mystery to me. Or, you know, I just started, not, uh, no, tell us no, I, it started so long ago. I remember that, uh, I was very active in the, in the nursing aspect of the college. I, I think the first thing I can remember really getting some of the nursing programs with MACOT going back in the, in the 60s and newer. It sort of just evolved and then we got pretty much through the conventional ladder. I think the section chairman, and then I got involved in many of the committees within the college, which led on to the vice chairman, district premier chairman. When, when, what years were those? Well, now you're really stressing me more. You really are. But I, th- I think I ended up being district chairman in about ni- 1980. I think it was in the late 70s. Yeah, right. And I think. I think I became the lapse in the vice president, and then went on to president, vice president, vice president. It was a rather conventional staircase situation, I thought. What do you remember particularly about your presidency? That's some odd things. I, mean, you know, I knew you were going to ask me that, and I thought um, basically being Catholic, I was sort of in 
enthralled and appalled at the same time that this was not too much after Roe versus Wade. And the Atman ordinance he made where he had to make some sort of a commitment. Uh, and I think that's probably the only time I ever get the front page of the New York Times on some of the things that, that were said. Uh, I think uh, perhaps to some criticism for your reader colleagues. Well, <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I don't think you could avoid that. That's, that's impossible. But that stuck in the mind. And I enjoyed that. So I kept pretty much of a pro-life sort of choice during toward pro-life, which I still feel rather strongly about. The sort of the middle of the road. The other thing I remember, which is I'm sure not in the minds of anybody else, but it was sort of the starting back then of our postgraduate courses at the College of Vienna. And so I'm always indebted to Dennis Kavanaugh and Tiffany Williams and Celso Garcia, because we used to call ourselves the road gang because we started out giving courses, the two and a half day courses in surgery. In those days, we used to give about two a year. And we, had, we meet, met recently, and I think we gave about 23 or 24. It was a large number. Covered most of the states, Hawaii, Puerto Rico. We obviously it's mainly that. because of one of the most popular courses well, we ever had. Well, it, it, it managed to sort of uh, tune up our own techniques and things like that. So. I, I do remember that very vividly as sort of a sort of a fun time. I remember the I think that's the first time we got in through Mark's efforts the multimedia approach at the opening ceremonies. And uh, I also remember vividly because I remember you were a little upset because I called you one day that I do remember this vividly that because <laughs> you didn't get mad but you were upset. I know you so well that I said, Well, I picked the Cosmos lecture. And it was President Ford. And I think the first thing you mentioned, well, how much is this going to cost I us? First I think I that was it. it. And I remember the figure very well. It was uh, eighteen thousand dollars. So we didn't have to pay. We didn't have to pay for the Secret Service, but we did have to pay for a few rooms that would surround so I'm the President. And uh, so I, I remember that vividly because I think we had about six or seven thousand in that whole ceremony. And it had been the same pretty much ever since. It clearly was the uh, largest figure as a Cosmo lecture we've ever had, and, 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 and a good talk. I think we all remember. Yeah, he that. got into his brothel jokes and things like that, but he gave a he gave his talk on healthcare mechanisms as, as he knew them to be. So. Of all the uh, of all the things that that you've done over the years, uh, you know, in your career yeah. for the college, uh, what would you most like to be remembered for? I, yeah, I never was, I think, very politically oriented. And basically, I, I think I enjoyed our specialty so much. I think I really like to be remembered as somewhat along the line of education, and lecturing, and in surgery. Those are, the, those are the three things I really have enjoyed. And the latter thing, the aspect of gynecologic surgery, is probably the thing that worries me the most pertaining to the future of that particular arm. But those are the things I would sort of like to be remembered for. Besides, you know, a father and a mother, and, you know, husband and grandmother and grandfather, all of these roles we assume. Well, I think you're you're certainly going to be remembered for the things that you want to be remembered for. As nothing pops into my mind faster when uh, the name Jim Breen comes up than does surgery, or you know, perhaps even more than that, the. Uh, the education that you've done over the years, both in surgery and in pathology. There have been a whole host of contributions since Northwestern. It's been a long time together. Jim, thanks for being with us today. Thank you, Warren. I enjoyed being here.